Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I am your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thank you to our generous underwriters on Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Thursday, September 1st, we are studying Deuteronomy 17, verses 8 to 20. Moses continues to emphasize the importance of justice in the promised land as he describes the process for certain legal decisions and gives laws for Israel's future kings. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Matt Ulmer. Pastor Ulmer serves at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Bishop, Texas. Pastor Ulmer, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Good morning. It's always good to be back. Uh, Pastor Ulmer, we're in chapter 17 of Deuteronomy today. What should we know about the book? Any context leading up to this text as we prepare to look at it today? Yeah, so I'm I'm sure that you've talked about this at length uh, with all of your guests previously, and I'm sure it's going to come up a whole bunch uh, in the conversations later, but Deuteronomy is this kind of second giving of the law after the people had been released from Egypt, after they had gone to receive uh, the covenant, and then the people kind of broke the covenant, were forced to wander for 40 days or for 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, they sit down and they, they listen to the law given again before they go in and possess the, the promised land. And in this law, uh, Moses kind of lays out all the things uh, to them that God uh, is expecting them to do, how they're going to uh, live in the land, how they're going to conduct justice, how they are to uh, take over uh, the cities and the lands and treat the people, how they're to eat, and, and all sorts of other uh, legal issues. Talk a little bit about justice from a biblical perspective. We looked at it yesterday at the end of chapter 16 and going into chapter 17. Moses really emphasizes justice, and it's very striking at the end of verse excuse me, the end of chapter 16, how he over and over again commands them, only justice you shall follow. And I think that that theme carries into our text for today. Uh, talk a little bit about what we should be thinking about when we think about justice in the biblical sense. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that you bringing that up, because I think uh, that idea of justice really comes to light in both of the major sections that we're going to be talking about today in, in Deuteronomy 17, it, it really seems to stem from justice in the context of the Israelites is living according to God's Word, uh, living according to the, to the Ten Commandments and all the commands of God which are laid out in the books of the Torah. This is going to be especially important and and explicit when we get into the conversation that Moses has to the people concerning uh, the potential future kings for the Israelites as their job as kings is to do justice. There's also a note in the this part about the legal decisions by priests and ju judges that does come up other places in Deuteronomy, uh, specifically talking about purging evil from Israel, um, there, there's different points in Deuteronomy where some things are, are so egregiously against God's Word, against God's law, that very extreme punishments are prescribed to make sure that these errors don't take root and uh, promulgate themselves in uh, Israel. Hmm. Let's go ahead and take a look at this text then. We're reading from Deuteronomy 17, beginning at verse 8. And 
If any case arises requiring decision between one kind of homicide and another, one kind of legal right and another, or one kind of assault and another, any case within your towns that is too difficult for you, then you shall arise and go up to the place that the Lord your God will choose. And you shall come to the Levitical priests and to the judge who is in office in those days, and you shall consult them, and they shall declare to you the decision." Then you shall do according to what they declare to you from that place that the Lord will choose. And you shall be careful to do according to all that they direct you, according to the instructions that they give you, and according to the decision which they pronounce to you, you shall do. You shall not turn aside from the verdict that they declare to you, either to the right hand or to the left. The man who acts presumptuously by not obeying the priest who stands to minister there before the Lord your God, or the judge, that man shall die. So you shall purge the evil from Israel, and all the people shall hear and fear, and not not act presumptuously again. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me, like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law, approved by the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes, and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. That's our text for today. That's Deuteronomy 17, verses 8 to 20. Pastor Elmer, just going back to your definition of of justice, that it is living in accord with the word of God, which I was very happy to hear you say that because that's pretty much what we said in the previous (laughs) program. So it's always nice when, when fellow pastors, they agree, they confirm what I, what I thought. So I appreciate that. I'm glad we're reading this the same way, but I, 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 I'm also, I'm also glad. So I, but the reason, the reason I, I find it helpful just looking at both of those sections together is because of this, this idea that not turning aside from the right or to the right or to the left, right? That we don't want to turn aside from justice because we don't want to turn aside from the word of God and just the way that those two concepts go hand in hand in the way that, you know, justice is described the way to, the word of God is described in Deuteronomy. I think putting those two together like that is very helpful. And we, we really should keep it in mind as we read Deuteronomy. I, yeah, I think, I think you, you have to, because as we're going to see in both of these sections, especially in the one about Kings, um, the Word of God and how God has set them apart to do things differently and, and to, to live as His people as a witness to Him, to the world, living according to His Word and by His Word is, is what gives them their strength and their power and their security. And in a lot of ways, what God is warning them against through Moses is against the things that are going to lead them away from him and thus lose that strength that they have. Mm. Well, let's uh, we'll get there with the kings. That is the <clears throat> excuse me, the second section here. Let's talk first about uh, what what seems to be almost a a court system of sorts that that may be a little bit anachronistic, but but this process for legal decisions, if there's decisions that are too difficult for the local town to handle there to go somewhere else, Take us into what Moses is describing. Give us give us a picture for what he's got in mind in this first section. Yes, yeah, as, as far as I understand this, when there were legal disputes, there were kind of two two different paths that could be taken. The the first of which would be kind of the local uh, courts taking care of it. Um, but apparently, there 
there would arise cases that would be too difficult for the local courts to take care of. So here in Deuteronomy 17, uh, Moses is laying out how God wants them to handle those cases. There could be more examples of this in Scripture, but the one that I kind of found in doing the research for this is you kind of see a pattern of this in Second Chronicles 19. Mm. Uh, in Second Chronicles 19, it describes Jehoshaphat in his reign setting up these systems. He first appoints judges in the fortified cities of Judah city by city, and then later he does kind of set up this, I don't know if, if you would call it like a supreme court or some kind of higher court that uh, takes its residence in the place that the Lord your God will choose, uh, which is another phrase that comes up all over in Deuteronomy uh, to describe that this court and its ministers are going to be in Jerusalem. So well, let's let's talk a little bit about that phrase that this court that's described is to be in the place that the Lord your God will choose. So far in the book of Deuteronomy, where we've seen that phrase, it's often been associated with the place where the Lord will choose for his name to dwell, and it's mm-hmm. especially been the place of worship. So is is this place, which is where the judgments will happen, if we a supreme court of sorts, it's not that it's not quite the same thing because there's not an appeals process here. It's simply that the lower court couldn't decide. It was too difficult for them. So it goes to the higher court. So it's not an appeal, which is why we should be careful and and not speak, you know, too, we shouldn't equate those things one to one, but for lack of of a better term, Supreme Court. Uh, To go back to the question, is this the same place, do you think? Is this supposed to be the same place as the place of worship? I I, I do. I do think that. Um, This is him pointing towards Jerusalem and you you do see that uh, in that passage that I talked about in Second Chronicles 19, where this higher court is set up and their seat is in Jerusalem. So I, I do I do think that it, it it's just the the way and the pattern of the people of God that 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 place is is where these uh, very uh, specific things take place, ultimate justice and worship and sacrifice. So, I mean, talk about the significance that it, it's happening in this central place that the Lord will choose. At this point in the narrative of the Old Testament, the people don't know what that place is because the, they have not gone into the promised land yet. The Lord hasn't chosen it and revealed it to them yet, but it, it's coming. You've said it's Jerusalem already. We, we know that from the rest of the Old Testament. What's the significance of the Lord choosing this place for all of this all these things to happen religiously, politically, civilly, all these, all these, these things. Yeah, I think the, I I don't know if it is, it's obvious, but kind of the most basic understanding of this phrase, the place that the Lord your God will choose is a recognition that he is the one who has the power and the authority to set these things for Mm. the people. And ultimately when these issues uh, come up that the people can't handle themselves in their local uh, areas, that when they're going to Jerusalem, when they are seeking the one whom God has kind of appointed to handle this stuff for them, that the justice that they're pronouncing is not merely uh, that priest or that judge's uh, justice, but God's. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why you get uh, such a harsh penalty for people who refuse to hear the judgment and abide by it. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. This is this is God's choosing. He chooses the place for it to happen because ultimately it is justice according to his word that is being given. This isn't simply a human court, but this is a court that abides by what God's word says. And again, that takes us back to the end of chapter 16, where Moses talks about appointing judges and officers in the towns, those who would not pervert justice, not show partiality, not accepting bribes, all of these things, a reminder, and the fact that it happens in the place where God chooses is also a reminder that this is God's justice. It's based on his word. It's not human opinion. And and even the place where it happens, that points to that same truth. 
Yeah, and, and I, I think we, we ought to expect this fully understanding that Israel, the Israelites, as they're set up in in the Torah and at, at least in their history, is, uh, we're not used to dealing with this kind of as American Christians in the 2020s, but we're dealing with kind of a pure theocracy here where they understand that, that God is king and that he is the one who has the power and the control. Mm. Right. That's kind of foreign to us, but that's what we're dealing with here in Deuteronomy 17. Sure, this is a part of their actual civil, political life that we're, we're seeing yeah. here in Deuteronomy 17. This is the way, and again, we use the term courts loosely so that we don't have too close an association with what we call a court today, but that's that's what's happening, is, is something very close to that. This is legal decisions for day-to-day life, and there's crimes mentioned here. You know, what kind of homicide is it? Is it, is it murder? Is it manslaughter? If you can't decide that locally, take it to the place where the name of the Lord will dwell, where he chooses. Same, you know, what kind of assault? All of these, these different potential chances for we're not sure what's going on here we're not sure what justice is according to the lord's word take it to that quote higher court where and it says moses says you shall come to in that place there will be levitical priests to judge yeah. and and then someone in office so it seems there's there's two different possibilities as to who might judge this either the levitical priests or or a judge of some sort uh, talk a little bit about the who is doing the judging here? Yeah, I, I think in, in that case, if, if I'm not mistaken, they're going to talk about a, a very loose separation between what might be considered ceremonial law and what might be considered civil law. Um, hmm. Understanding that even that separation probably would not have existed for an Israelite in the area or in the uh, age of Deuteronomy, because kind of the the civil ceremonial life and the and just the regular civic life, they're they're so intertwined because of their identity as the people of God that it's hard to hard to separate. Mm-hmm. But you have the Levitical priests in, involved, kind of specifically for that reason. If if any of these cases, uh, any of these disputes involve uh, worship practice, if they involve the religious life, you're going to have to have people there who are at least uh, educated and versed in the the law to be able to to make an appropriate determination. Hmm. And so, I mean, that's the Levitical priests. It, the yeah. second part, you also take, so you shall come to the Levitical priests and then to the judge who is in office in those days. Is that is is that judge similar to what we saw at the end of chapter sixteen? Like the, you know, there are judges in these local towns, but then there's one who will be appointed as a, again, take this loosely, but a, the chief justice of the land. I, from what I have read and seen, that does seem to be the case that there is. A, a person appointed at least for a set time where that responsibility falls on that said person. Mm-hmm. I know you you get some of this language uh, in Ezekiel 44 talking about kind of the the new temple in Ezekiel's vision, where where when all of the new system is set up post exile, you do you do see an image of these priests. And, and their judgment role coming into um, the the religion and the civil life of those coming out of exile. I don't know if that's kind of what you're looking at, but it, that, that seems to be the case, at least in what I've read. Yeah, it does, it's interesting, or at least I think it's interesting, that this judge who is in office in those days is mentioned, but there's doesn't seem to be anything as to who appoints that judge or how he is appointed, other than... Again, something like what we heard previously in chapter 16, you shall appoint judges and officers in your towns, or even thinking back to the way Moses delegated responsibility in the book of Exodus, which was referenced earlier in Deuteronomy, you know, to men who didn't love bribes and who who knew the law of God. So it seems that this is just an, another judge who's taken that, he's to the nth degree, again, a yeah. loosely chief justice of sorts. He's also there to help with the Levitical priest in the role of 
bringing justice in this situation, making that just decision according to God's word. Yeah, that, that, that seems to be uh, how I understand it as well. So you go there to the place where the Lord your God will choose. This is Jerusalem. The Levitical priests and the primary judge, they are involved. You consult them. They make the decision. And as we've said, this is the decision that is based on God's word. And then verse 10, you do it. There, There's no questions asked. When the decision is handed down, you do what they say, and that's that. Yeah, I I think there's a, a couple of very interesting things to say, the first of which is it would be repeating exactly what you said. It, it's very interesting that when when these people speak, when these judges speak, or when this kind of high judge speaks, that it's almost like the whole Koamar Yahweh, thus says the Lord. Mm. When that thing happens, this is justice in that case. There is no arguing it. Um, that that to me seems to be very, very interesting. Kind of the second part that I kind of thought about later was, this is actually kind of a very interesting and good system, because I think because of the nature of the judgment and, and how harsh the penalty is for not abiding by the judgment, it really leaves this system up to only handle cases like it says in verse 8, that can't be handled uh, in the local court system. You kind of get kind of get parallels to this when Jesus kind of speaks, like in the, in the Sermon on the Mount about when you're angry mm-hmm. with your brother, handle it uh, quickly, lest you be handed over the judge, because once you get handed over the judge, what happens? Um, you, you subject yourself to his judgment. Hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and you're going to get locked away right then and there as this, yeah. as this tech. Yeah. I, I, I think that's good background to those words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. When he speaks with yeah. that level of seriousness, you see this seriousness here. Now, uh, elaborate on that a little bit more, Pastor Elmer. You had brought it up earlier. Why is it that the Lord is so clear cut here that what what the decision that is handed down, you do it, you don't turn aside to the right or to the left. Why is that that strict obedience commanded here? Well, I, I think it, it has to do with two two reasons. Number one is they're going to the place and the person that the Lord God has set up to handle this. So to to kind of invoke this right or this process is to invoke the name of Yahweh their God to handle their disputes. And to reject the decision would be to reject um, God's judgment, and to reject God's judgment by definition, I think, would be to not do justice. Hmm. Right. And this is, well, uh, just to to jump in briefly, that's what we were saying at the very beginning. When we're talking about justice among God's people, we are talking about the living out, the carrying out of God's word. And so to, to disobey God's word, to change God's word, to swerve from God's word to the right or to the left, we've heard just how serious that is in the book of Deuteronomy already. So by, by way of, you know, I mean, just by carrying that to its conclusion, to depart from the decision given based on God's word is to depart from the ways of God and to bring about all of the harsh penalties that God has spoken about and will continue to speak about in this book. Yeah, because by doing that, uh, the, the person who rejects God's word is, is doing a couple things. They're rejecting God's kingship, rejecting the, the notion that he has the ability to make these right judgments for mankind. And also, they're undermining a very important uh, concept that we'll definitely get at in the next part as well, which is understanding that this justice, this upholding God's Word, not only has to do with their civic life, living neighbor to neighbor, but also has to do with the preservation of the Israelite faith which I think is why you get this connection here to the purging of mm. evil. What is that evil that the people of God, whom he claimed uh, with his own name, with his mighty power, saving them from Egypt, that they would leave um, his hand? 
I think all of these laws that are set up are to 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 keep his people in his fold uh, that they might not uh, die. Hmm. Uh, dig into that connection a little bit more. You you've brought it up this matter of purging the evil from Israel or as we heard in just the previous text purging the evil from your midst. We also heard it in chapter 13 both that time in chapter 13 and just the previous time in chapter 17 were dealing with the death penalty for those who had engaged in idolatry. Here we're, we're there exactly. Right. So and here we're talking about purging the evil from your midst because you've disobeyed and acted presumptuously concerning the decision given by the priest and the judge. Make that connection clear for us. Well, I I, I think this this is going to just be a clear clear-cut case of, of idolatry, because if, if you're ignoring the ruling of God through his judge, then you are setting something or somebody, mm. maybe even yourself, up as judge. Or not as judge, but as an idol. You're setting yourself off as, as God. And that that seems to be the biggest thing that God is protecting here, is that first commandment, you shall have no other gods. Um this having idols seems to be the the biggest thing that God is trying to protect his people uh, against, and we will see that in nearly all of the qualifications that are coming up in the next section. Mm. Yeah, so God's concern for justice is related to his word, which is related to whether or not you're worshiping an idol or not, and so the seriousness of holding true to God's word, not following after evil, it remains in this section concerning the decisions by priests, by judges. We're going to keep talking through this text on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're looking at Deuteronomy 17 this morning with Pastor Matt Ulmer. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable. A college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran. A college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Thursday, September 1st. We're studying Deuteronomy 17, verses 8 to 20 with Pastor Matt Ulmer. He serves at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Bishop, Texas. Pastor Ulmer, prior to the break, we were talking about the first section of our text in which the Lord tells his people to go to the place that he will choose in those cases when legal decisions are too much for the local courts. Because they are making decisions based on God's word, they are to be followed If not, the penalty is severe because justice is found in God's word and in God's word alone. That theme of justice then does continue, even if there is a slight shift here in verse 14, as we begin to think about the topic of kings. Uh, One one thing that I found helpful in Professor Harstad's commentary on Deuteronomy is that starting with verse 14, you do begin to see three offices for the people of God that are important. We have king first, then we have priest, and then we have prophet as we move into chapter 18. And so if you remember your confirmation days, Usually we do the order prophet, priest, king here, but that's that's what you start to see. We're going to see kings, then priests, then prophets. You and I get to talk about kings. Now, we do. This is m- maybe a surprising section to come to in Deuteronomy 17. And I think you even said it. The Lord is king for the people Israel. 
they haven't had a king up to this point. They haven't asked for a king up to this point. What? Where does this come from? All of a sudden, we're, we're talking about the possibility and even, I would say, the the likelihood, the probability of kings. Where is this coming the, from? The inevitability. Yeah. yeah. Where is it coming from? Yeah, so I'm I'm glad that you caught that I said that because I used that language intentionally and on purpose. <laughs> because the the people Israel were to be the people who only had Yahweh as their king. So uh, when I was doing this study when I when I got the when I got the assignment for, for the conversation that we're having this morning and reading through it, I was like, oh, I'd kind of forgotten about this. That prior to Israel having a king, there's instructions in Deuteronomy, because what the, the kings don't come around for a long time. We haven't even gotten to the conquest. We haven't even gotten to the time of the judges yet. So we're still a long ways off from the kings yet, kind of prophetically, uh, we we have this uh, rule, uh, a set of rules for determining who's king. And I think that the main thing that I think if anybody takes anything away from this part of our conversation is understanding that when the time came for Israel to say, hey, God, we want a king like our neighbors, which, by the way, happens in 1 Samuel 8, so... We'll talk about that in a little bit. When that time comes, uh, the the rules by which the king will be appointed have already been set set out, and that rule is, um, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. Mm. So in this case, uh, even though they they might have permission to set up a king, they never have the authority or the ability to do it apart from God's choosing, because they are still kind of by definition a theocracy. So, and I I should say, this isn't the first time in the Old Testament where the matter of kings among God's people has come up. As as we were talking, I, I was reminded of the fact that in Genesis 17, when the Lord changes Abram's name to Abraham and Sarai's name to Sarah, he says of Sarah that kings of peoples shall come from her. So this isn't yeah. entirely out of the blue that there are going to be kings among God's people, the descendants of Abraham. At the same time, just in the way that you were talking, it, it does seem that there's some tension here because this isn't a command for Israel. Make sure you set up a king when you get into the promised land. It's almost more like a, a concession. Like the Lord says, yeah. I know at some point you're going to want a king. And well, that may not be the best idea in the world, but here's how you're going to do it when you get there. Something like that. Yeah. And that that kind of, this might not be the best idea, definitely comes in, in the Samuel narratives when uh, Samuel, at God's command, warns them of what the kings are going to do, and how God, when Samuel gets really, really mad at the people that they've rejected Samuel, God God tells Samuel, no, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me as their king. So you you, you definitely get the flavor that while this is not the ideal, because of their hard-headedness, and because of what, what I think is ultimately their lack of faith, they're going to want and even demand a king. Therefore, God is setting up. I, I will permit this in time, but understand, I get to make the choice. You don't. Mm. Well, and I think, you know, the, the thing when it comes to the kings in the Old Testament is that we, we know that the kings in the Old Testament are intended to point forward to the king, tap, capital T, capital K, our Lord Jesus Christ, who, uh, you know, I mentioned the three offices. He fulfills them all. He is the king for God's people. In fact, he's the king over all creation, as, as we know. So that's the, there's kind of, again, this, this tension that on the one hand, when the Lord gives these rules and laws concerning kings and he allows for kings for his people in the Old Testament, it's not inherently 
evil or sinful, but in the way that it gets put into practice in the Old Testament and the way that they forget what we've read here, then you, you see how much is needed for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that none of the kings in the Old Testament live up to this. It's only our Lord Jesus Christ who who finally gets this right. Yeah, and, and that's absolutely the case, and I'm so glad that you, you said it in that way, that even even the kings who who get a seal of approval in the Old Testament, as as we will talk about here, don't live up to this very, very high standard for the king set up in Deuteron- Deuteronomy 17. However, there is a king who who does uh, hold all of these qualities, the, the king of kings and lord of lords himself, the, our risen and ascended Jesus Christ. Mm. So let, let's start talking about what the Lord says concerning kings. When when the time comes, you know, as, as the Lord says through Moses in verse 14, you say, I'll set a king over me like all the nations are around me. He says in 15, you can do that. You, you, if you, you can. But the first thing you have to realize is that this is going to be the king that the Lord your God will choose. And you've mentioned this several times already, Pastor Ulmer. Talk a little bit more about yeah. that. So, yeah, it just because Israel will get a king in the future does not change the fact that they are a theocracy where Yahweh is their king, and therefore he is the one who, who gets to choose who that person is. This happens in, in the case of Saul, this happens in the case of David, this happens in the case of Solomon, and it happens in the case of, of all the kings as they are anointed and appointed by by the priests, when when the people get a king, uh, that king is uh, Yahweh's representative uh, to them. So he gets he gets that choice. So that's that's the number one thing is that the king is the one chosen by the Lord. Uh, you see this early on, particularly both in the case of Saul, Israel's first king, and also David, Israel's second king. It's very clear when Samuel goes to that that individual and says, you're the one, right? And, and the anointing mm-hmm. happens. So this is, is made very plain that even afterwards, when particularly in the Southern kingdom, Judah, knowing that the Lord has given his promise to the line of David to have the king on the throne of Israel, you, you see that this is going to be the one that the Lord chooses. He's the one to be on the throne. So that that's over all of this. This is the Lord's yes. choosing. Now the I, I, go ahead. I, I would say that that's the most important. Uh, this is the most important one of these commands. Understanding that it is the command that kind of energizes the rest of these qualities that we're about to talk about. So the next thing that comes is it needs to be one of your brothers. He needs to be an Israelite. Why is that an important qualification? Well, I think this has to do with. The, the covenant mm. under which they are living, it is, it's a covenant made to, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. It is a covenant made to the people on Sinai with the, the, the sprinkling of the blood. It is um, the covenant kind of given by the re-giving of the law here, that this rule is, is set over that group of people, and therefore having one of their brothers be their king is a is an element of understanding that you should not be ruled by somebody who does not understand the law uh, which you live under. Um, from everything that I understand, everything that I've read about this particular instance, th- this is a safeguard against foreigners specifically non-believers coming in and exercising political authority over the people. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and so it, in it that... has to do with God. It has to do with the theocracy. It has to do with the law, which is divine. Right. And in that exercising of political authority, there is just inherent within that an exercising of religious authority. I mean, you yeah. see that over and over again through the history of God's people, that when the king is faithful to the Lord, the people tend to be faithful to the Lord. It's, it's not perfect one-to-one, but certainly when the king is unfaithful, 
he definitely leads the people astray. And so to have one of the brothers, one of the Israelites, be a king, this is just a, I mean, it makes perfect sense because if the Lord is concerned as he is with no idolatry, then that's got to be number one. It, he needs to be an Israelite, one who's faithful to the Lord, who has been faithful to his people. Yeah, and and I know that this doesn't exactly directly equate here, but this ends up being the problem with the first of Israel's kings. Um, what ends up being Saul's downfall, It it's it's not that he's a foreigner, it's that he he for, kind of forgets his place, and he, he forgets to live according to the rules and the commands of God. Uh, what ends up being his downfall is when when he doesn't feel like God is hearing him, he makes a sacrifice in a place that's not Jerusalem. He makes a sacrifice in Gilgal, which is explicitly against um, the command in Deuteronomy chapter 12, which you've already talked about. Mm. So the, the next thing that comes up in the way of kings, after it needs to be a brother, then no horses. Don't acquire many horses. Now, what's what's wrong with horses, Pastor Ulmer? I, our, our secretary here at Grace, she's she's got some horses. What's what's wrong with horses? So I, I would say, on their own, there's nothing wrong with horses, <laughs> right? So to your secretary, I think we we all love uh, horses, uh, the wonderful animals that they are. I think the command here is is, is a very it's a theological assertion and it's a practical assertion. So horses to the Israelites in this time in history, horses are mainly used to to pull chariots, which are going to be your main power fighting force, a, a fighting force that Egypt at this time was well known for. So here you, you kind of have uh, this prohibition of acquiring many horses is kind of twofold. Number one, it's a recognition by the king that his military might does not and will never come from the technology of man. Hmm. So that when Israel needs to fight its wars, they don't fight them with spears and chariots and horses. They fight them with the Lord. We see this playing out over the, the course of the history of God's people. When they're released from slavery in Egypt, do they win their freedom by horses and chariots? And the answer is obviously no. no. When the Egyptian army is chasing them down on the other side of the Red Sea, is it a military might and prowess that saves the people? No, God's the one who saves them. When they go into the land to conquer it, uh, do they rely on the power of beasts and of technology to win the land? No. Jericho, they're told to march around the city uh, once a day for six days and then seven times on the seventh to blow their horn. And, and yell, and the walls will come crumbling down. The, the, the history of the Israelites being successful in war has to do with them following God, following the law. Uh, so in that way, it's a parallel to everything that we've already talked about. These people are to know that their identity and their strength comes not from themselves, but from God. Mm. The, That's the, part one. The only thing I will add to that, Pastor Ulmer, is, is simply to read Psalm 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Uh, keep keep going. Amen. Keep keep talking. We, so we've got no horses and um, connected to that not to return to Egypt. Yeah, so in in this understanding, Egypt uh, apparently is the place where a lot of people got their chariots and their horses from. So in this is a pro prohibition to, to return to Egypt, to trade with Egypt to obtain horses and chariots, uh, which in its own way seems, God seems to be telling his people through um that the prophet Moses here, that doing so would be yoking themselves to, to Egypt and their strength. This happens, it can happen either passively by, by trading with them to obtain these things, to obtain strength for themselves, or like we do see uh, later on in the Old Testament, where uh, when the Babylonians come to attack Judah, who is it that Judah goes, 
running and screaming for help? Do they do they sit down and pray to Yahweh to save them? Uh, no, they they try to make a military alliance with Egypt, which ends up ultimately failing. And, and God in Ezekiel tells them yeah. that that alliance will fail. Yeah. So you you have this this idea that going to Egypt for its strength is just to return to slavery, and that is a is a prohibition to God's people. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think too there may be something in the way of idolatry there again because you know, you have the Egyptian idolatry that would have infected the people while they were there. So maybe a, a bit of that, but certainly the idea of strength. Where is your help going to come from? It's going to come from the Lord. Give us the last two requirements before we finish with the Word of God in seventeen. Not many wives and not a lot of silver or gold. Yeah. So the. The not many wives here, I, I think, is for us in in 2020 uh, world, we don't understand the significance really of many wives. You probably heard about it in different Bible studies, but in this day and age, um, a lot of political alliances were were based on marriage, and a lot of the uh, polygamy had to do with obtaining political alliances. So if you wanted to ally yourself with another kingdom, uh, there would be a marriage between a king and, and one of the, the princesses, or, or so on and so forth. So in one way, it's a prohibition against trying to obtain physical strength by, by civil alliances. Number two is you have the, the worry that is the same where the the people are prohibited from marrying into or taking the the women of the Canaanites as their wives because the more wives you have coming from different uh, kingdoms and different cultures and different religions, there's always the threat and a major threat that the the religion of the wife will then infect the household and pull people away from the one true religion, which is in Yahweh, their God, who uh, saved them from the hand of Egypt. Mm. Something that's striking about these commands, which we probably should just mention and move on, is that when you look at the things God says not to do, one of the biggest examples of kings in the Old Testament who does these things is Solomon. Of all of all of the kings, oh, you yeah. wouldn't have expected it, but he's the one, especially toward the end of his life, that he does all of these things that the Lord says not to do. And you see that the consequences of, of how that affects Israel as a whole, when you go past the reign of King Solomon, you just see how things do start to just go downhill from there. Yeah, absolutely. And for any of the listeners, um, if you want to see... Uh, the example of kind of Solomon's extravagant wealth, that's where you look in 1 Kings 10. Um, the amount of, of wealth and horses and, and wives that he had accrued is just astronomical. Mm, yeah, and it's and in chapter 11 where you start to see the ill effects of that. So yeah, yeah. just a, a, Solomon ends up standing as a, a warning against these things, especially at the end of his life. We've got about seven minutes here, Pastor Elmer, so I want to make sure we, we spend plenty of time here at the end. The, the key thing that the king is to do, we've talked a lot about what he's not to do, the thing he's supposed to do is write the Word of God, read the Word of God on a regular basis. So take us into the, these last three verses. Yeah, so the, the the proper king, the one who is able to to lead God's people, has to do so not only with God's blessing, but has to do it according to God's law, because God's law, God's word, is righteousness and is justice. So any king uh, seeking to do this task will will do it based on the word of God. And how does a man stay in the word of God? Well, I think he, he reads it and has it with him. So we have this command here that each of the kings is to, to have a copy of the law approved by the priests, and, and this is to, to guide him, to give him wisdom, to give him strength, to give him discernment in order to fulfill the task that God has instilled in him to do. So what is what is envisioned here? I mean, in these last three verses, it talks about the king writing, it talks about him reading, interacting with the priests in this. Give us kind of a, just a breakdown of, of what the Lord is telling his kings to do here. 
Well, I, I think it has to do with the Lord telling us kings, if if you wish to be a king, if you wish to lead my people, you will do it in my way, not your way. The way of man is to uh, exercise political power over people, it's to acquire military technology and, and wealth and influence, but but your power is going to come from my word, therefore you need to to have access to it, you need to study it, you need to understand it, you need to be in it, so that in everything you do is is flavored by the Word of God. Hmm. And, 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 and to that end, the king is to write a copy of this book, and it, it seems that the copy of this book here is probably the book of Deuteronomy, not just this particular section concerning kings, but likely this whole book of Deuteronomy, or maybe large chunks of it, we're not entirely sure, but it seems that it's the book of Deuteronomy. He is to write this, and then he's to read it all the days of his life. And this standard, the Word of God, becomes the standard by which he is judged successful or not. It, it, it's not an economic thing. It's not a political thing. It is theology by which he is to be judged. And you can see this within the the history of the kings of of Israel, I remember it was in an Old Testament class in college when a professor pointed out that one of the kings of Israel, Omri, who is the the father of Ahab, that may be a more familiar name to to many. Mm-hmm. Omri, in terms of larger political success, was actually a pretty successful king and did a lot of things in terms of establishing himself as a dynasty in the northern kingdom. But when you look at the account of what a uh, set of Omri in the scriptures. He, he didn't listen to the word of God. And so that's the end of his story. It's, it's quite something to see how, how faithfulness to the word of God is the standard by which the king is measured. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll kind of go just back to what I had mentioned about the downfall of Saul. It's the same thing. What was his downfall? Was it his ability to lead people in battle? Was it his strength or his handsomeness? No, it was he did what was forbidden for him. And because of that, God's favor was pulled. And that's it. What makes you good? Uh, you you obey God's law. You you follow His statutes. What makes you a evil king? You turn aside and, and do things your own way. Mm-hmm. Right, and and we see more often than not in the Old Testament, there's a lot more of those unfaithful kings than there are faithful kings in the Northern Kingdom. When the the kingdoms are split, the Northern Kingdom, I believe, has no faithful kings. And in the southern kingdom, Judah, which is where Jerusalem is, there's a handful of them. Josiah, yeah. Hezekiah come to mind right away. There's a few others in there, but they they just aren't faithful kings. And, and as we said, this is all pointing us forward to our Lord Jesus Christ. So we've got about three minutes here, Pastor Ulmer. Help us to see how all of this spoken about kings, even though it's never fulfilled in the Old Testament, how is it all pointing us to the king, Jesus? Yeah, so th- this might be a, a little soapbox of mine, but what what I this really reminds me of is um, in the Gospel of Luke twenty two, when on the night when Jesus was betrayed, his disciples have a conversation about who is the greatest. Uh, Jesus says to them, "The kings, of the Gentiles, exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors." But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. Um, Jesus, being the King of kings and Lord of lords, is the one who, who exercises this command to be king perfectly. Not only does he, he know the law, not only does he know the word because he is the word, not only does he live the word, but he also uh, comes humble not uh, desiring to exercise a political authority and power over his people, but he doesn't seek wealth, he doesn't seek a, a sword, even though all these things rightfully belong to him. He ultimately exercises his, his power in his service to people, that for his uh, people— for our sake, he would give up his life and take it back that we might be forgiven and have a place uh, with him in his everlasting kingdom forever. That is our hope, and that is our joy, uh, having this perfect king. 
Pastor Matt Ulmer is pastor at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Bishop, Texas, helping us today with Deuteronomy 17, verses 8 to 20. Pastor Ulmer, thanks for being our guest today. It's always a privilege. The sign over Jesus on the cross read, This is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Truly, Jesus is the King, our King, the one who did not come to acquire riches or power for himself, but one who came to use his power for our salvation that we might share in his heavenly riches. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about Deuteronomy, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. We always love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow. Tomorrow.